morning and welcome to the House Natural Resources Fish and Wildlife Committee. Uh, this morning we are going to be taking up um, I think it's the right bill titles that you have here actually. It's S148. Uh, I think it's the right number but the title may not be right so I'm not going to read it. And um, we are, I just want to remind our witnesses i want to thank you for being here with us this morning and then say that we this is intended to be an introduction of this topic to our committee which means um we're not gonna have a ton of time for any one of you we will be taking further testimony in the future there are seven people on the list here and um although i think i will ask the agency how many of you are intending to present <laughs> two okay um, actually, one, two, three, four of you. Sorry, I can't go. So six people on the list divided by an hour. Um, just please keep that in mind when you are give, sharing your testimony with us. So with that, thank you for being here. And we will start with Bindu Panikar, the Assistant Professor of Gund Institute for the Environment. Welcome, Ms. Panikar. Good morning, everyone. Um, Thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to be uh, talking to this panel or to testify in support of uh, the Environmental Justice Bill S-148, introduced by Senator Keisha Ram Hinsdale. Um, my name is uh, uh, Bindu Panika. I'm an assistant professor at the Rubenstein School of the Environment and Natural Resources also a fellow at the Gund Institute of the Environment and also a member of uh, the Rejoice and a Renews BIPOC Council. Um, so we live in troubled times and uh, each day we get reminders that lack of, lack of equity costs li lives. Be the death of uh, George Floyd, uh, the poor communities overlooked for decades, impacted uh, more heavily in the aftermath of Hurricane uh, Katrina or Maria or the innocent civilians in uh, Ukraine or Afghanistan. We have to be inclusive in thinking, especially within policy making, of those ignored and left behind who have been marginalized for decades, if not centuries. Uh, today, so even if I am a South Asian immigrant myself, um, today I'm here to speak about my uh, EJ work uh, as a scholar. EJ uh, in the state is important to define because Vermont is unlike other states. It is one of the most homogeneous states in the country. It has relatively fewer environmental burdens compared to other states. But still, my research shows that people in the state do not experience the environment the same way. I started my work uh, by doing spatial analysis work. Um, um, and uh, we looked at the intersection of uh, those with fewer uh, privileges, including BIPOC people, those living in poverty, mobile home residents, people who have limited English proficiency, those who are renters uh, uh, in the state and so on, and how they experience uh, environmental and health risks uh, in the state. Together, we drew upon about 28 different variables to create a spatial tool called the Vermont um, Health Disparities Index. Each tract in Vermont was given a score based on these uh, 28 variables. That is how we have identified those most at risk to environmental and health disparities in the state based on these 28 indicators. It is clear from this study that Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the state are especially more exposed to historic environmental risks than the rest in the state. This association was uh, not seen among um, the poor in the state, interestingly. 
in particular, the tracks with uh, BIPOC and people with limited English proficiency were significantly more at risk from historic environmental risk, historic sites of pollution, heat vulnerability, and air pollution than the rest of the population. So interesting set of results from just uh, doing the spatial analysis. We followed uh, uh, the spatial analysis by conducting a statewide survey work. Um, mm -hmm. This actually brought to bear uh, the limitations within uh, doing spatial analysis or doing one approach alone. Um, you know, it does not really capture well um, uh, you know, the populational um, risks and their needs. The survey work actually showed that both BIPOC uh, people and those living under poverty in the state had less access to environmental benefits. So the spatial uh, revealed much more historical burden uh, and environmental risks to BIPOC population, but um, here uh, the survey work actually showed um, uh, less access to benefits and environmental benefits among both, uh, uh, especially low income population and the BIPOC group. The, Bi uh, the BIPOC people were twice as likely to report exposures to mold, lack of access to public transportation, not to own a vehicle, have trouble paying for food, um, not to have a primary care doctor, report immune disorders, and three times more likely uh, to rely uh, heavily on public transportation, have trouble paying for electricity, go hungry in a month, and report higher rates of um, Lyme disease compared to uh, the white population. Um, similar trends were also seen among, um, you know, um, the income poor communities. So these are examples of widespread disparities across wide ranging essential services. This is not a luxury we are talking about, but simple basic human needs that should be everyone's human right. So while um, Vermont is um, taking also bold moves to address climate change by break breaking our addiction to fossil fuels, it also needs to happen in a way that supports those communities most vulnerable to, to, to climate change. Communities with low socioeconomic status, uh, Vermonters of colors and those living in uh, more rural uh, 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 areas all face burdens of fossil fuel <laughs> and infrastructure in quite unique ways. Without affordable, clean alternatives, uh, investment in public or electric transportation infrastructure in areas lacking such investment, you know, a clean uh, energy transition is 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 uh, is quite a bit hard. Our study published <laughs> lately in Energy Policy found uh, that uh, climate initiatives are not often benefiting communities of color. Communities of color were seven times less likely to have rooftop solar than white respondents. So to have justice, it becomes imperative first to identify injustices that exist in order to then address underlying causes of them. This process of inquiry, conducting say spatial analysis in this case or community engaged research, uh, both quantitative and qualitative, should be part of any state department to help explain the root causes of inequities, oppressions, and power structures that create vulnerabilities and risks to particular communities. Environmental justice underscores an unequal pre present that uh, certain communities are bearing the brunt of environmental degradation while also being denied the fruit uh, of solutions or actions. We know that environmental injustice have been built on centuries of unequal social relations through processes of colonization, industrialization, and capitalize, uh, capitalism. EJ communities have been trapped into systemic inequities 
uh, that subject them to higher historic uh, environmental risks, lower environmental burdens, and premature death deaths. These social and civil rights inequities and the environmental and health uh, crisis we face in the world are totally connected. Uh, the environmental and health crisis we face in our nation and the world today cannot be addressed without addressing injustices. Our economic future and environmental future are inextricably linked. While uh, it is easy to reduce environmental justice to questions about particular facts or even distributional justice considerations um, or norms of economy and instrumental policy means, we should not forget that justice is inherently about social values and the social ordering, um, orderings that structure uh, hierarchies. In our in-depth interviews, uh, um, people identified EJ as an intersection of political power, poverty, and pollution. That it is about uh, components of power and powerlessness that EJ is uh, always already at the crossroads rather than fix a meaning in time and space. The process and politics of meaning making is what makes EJ con continually relevant. Hence, Top-down orderings are not likely to be sufficient in addressing uh, inequities. Instead, community engagement and, and organizing has to be incorporated uh, to uh, make meaningful impact. Participation is a key political capability necessary to ensure true democracy. So recognizing the way people function, acknowledging and incorporating the diverse ways of functioning, knowing and practices are also key elements of justice. So we have a unique opportunity here to elevate environmental justice. Um, you know, environmental protection is not just about protecting wilderness and keeping it beautiful for Vermonters. It is about making our urban and suburban neighborhoods safe, clean places to live, work, and raise a family for all. So our environmental solutions must be inter intersectional. We have to look to solutions that benefit local community, that increases the community capabilities, increases agency and cooperation uh, on local decision-making, uh, uh, and um, galvanizes these societies to be self-sufficient and sustainable. Uh, and uh, uh, environmental justice is also about yearning for a better future for all and creating a healing path forward for communities that have been left behind uh, and left out. In short, um, in Vermont, social and environmental concerns are deeply entangled. Environmental and health disparities are prominent in BIPOC and low-income population. Some of these disparities are historical and many are related to lack of access to environmental benefits. These inequities are preventable. Uh, the EJ definition proposed in the bill has been workshopped in multiple BIPOC communities word for word before including it in the bill, framed, um, in including it in the bill. We have a responsibility to also adopt more traditional ecological approaches within environmental dis decision making in collaboration with uh, indigen indigenous communities uh, with expertise. Um, and uh, targeted responses, policies, and action are required to address these systemic inequities. Uh, why uh, we need to support state-based EJ policy as soon as possible, proper investments, and community-centered programs are required to address these systemic uh, inequities. Why we have to commit to a targeted spending of at least 55% of 
environmental renewable energy and climate um, mitigation, transportation, climate resilience funds in designated environmental justice community. Uh, we need to, uh, we will need community centered grounds up approach to build a just and sustainable Vermont. So Vermont should not be uh, one of the last states to incorporate environmental justice within state policies. We need the state support and resources to carry out this transformative work forward of building back a just and sustainable Vermont. So um, thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity to speak. And um, thank you also, Senator Rahm, for introducing uh, this bill again. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Do, do your members have questions? All right, I'm not seeing any. Thank you again for joining us this morning, Ms. Panikar and for being flexible. I know you had other commitments, so I very much appreciate that. Thanks much. Um, next up, we have Elena Mahali, Vice President at the Conservation Law Foundation. Welcome, Ms. Mah Mah Mahali. How do you have to Thank you, Mahali, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for the invitation to speak. For the record, Elena Mahali, Director of, of CLF Vermont, um, and Lizzie um, has given me screen sharing powers. So um, what I did is I put together um, a brief PowerPoint presentation just to walk the committee through this bill. Uh, I was uh, present for all of the discussions on the Senate side and so have a lot of context, but we'll try and fly through just an overview today knowing that this is intended to be an introduction, not an in-depth policy discussion. Um, Feel free to stop me if folks have questions or I'm happy to take them at the end. So why is CLF here? I just did want to flag that we have been working on environmental justice issues throughout New England, uh, side by side with grassroots partners on everything from issues related to hazardous siting of facilities uh, to the uh, lead in drinking water issue to transportation justice and more. And we were very proud to help Massachusetts pass their first environmental justice law last year. We are currently supporting the Maine governor's office to help them develop their environmental justice protections. And we're partnering with dozens of organizations and stakeholders here in Vermont to help uh, represent their interests here in the state house for a strong environmental justice bill. And just to give the committee a sense of how many organizations I'm talking about, this is a list of over 30 organizations across the state that are supporting S-148. I have submitted for your review uh, a sign-on letter that was uh, sent in on the Senate side to support S-148. And as you can see, this is a wide coalition, uh, a diverse coalition of not just environmental organizations, but also social justice organizations, uh, also the uh, Affordable Housing Coalition, the Association of Planning and Development Agencies, uh, and more. So a very, very well-supported bill. The reason why it's critical for Vermont to act this year, as Dr. Panikar noted, there are increasing states across the country that are enacting environmental justice laws, and we don't wanna be behind the ball on this one. Already 17 states across the country have what are called environmental justice mapping tools that help state decision makers uh, figure out where there are overburdened and underserved communities. Also, a lot of Vermont's agencies lack what are called community engagement plans. These plans serve as critical indicators of whether the state is actually in compliance with Title VI of the Federal Civil Rights Act. And so this bill gets at setting a date certain for when agencies have to have these community engagement plans. And finally, Vermont's Climate Action Plan, which was just uh, you know, a long labor that was worked on over the past year calls for an environmental justice policy, which is also contained in this bill. So there are seven components listed here that are in the bill, and I will just briefly walk through them one by one to give uh, committee members a sense of what, what, what S-148 contains. 
The first section is the finding section. It is longer than maybe some bills you will have seen, uh, but as Dr. Panikar noted, um, a lot of research has actually been done to uh, detail the various disproportionate impacts of environmental burdens in the state of Vermont, as well as the inequitable distribution of environmental benefits. And these findings were actually worked on uh, by the Vermont Law School's Environmental Justice uh, Clinic and clinicians uh, made sure that there are uh, underlying citations and facts to support every single uh, finding. So this, this portion of the bill has been worked on for, for several years, actually. The definition section also, uh, many of these definitions were workshopped through the Rejoice Collaborative over the course of the last several years through stakeholder input to define these terms. The one term that is new um, when this bill was reintroduced this year is the, the environmental justice population. It's critical that this term is defined in statute. Uh, it's really best practice across the country as, as states are starting to enact environmental justice laws. They are wanting to have a definition for this population, the focus population, if you will, of the benefits in the bill. And the reason why we chose the definition we did is because demographics actually are a very good predictor of which segments of the population are going to disproportionately be impacted by environmental burdens. Um, we say that this is important as opposed to having something like if you are living within half a mile of a hazardous waste facility or some other hazard exposure, because that puts the onus on the individuals to somehow prove that they are more burdened or at risk. And given how uh, predictive these demographic factors are for those folks who are living with more disproportionate burdens, the best practice is to just use those demographic factors to define these this class of people that we are going to focus our energy on. So S-148 has a definition of environmental justice populations that is based on three demographic criteria, race, low income, and li limited English proficiency. Essentially, what we did is we took statewide averages and we said, hey, anywhere in the state where there's a concentration, where it's above the state average, that's an area that's gonna be highlighted, if you will, as an environmental justice population. We know this definition isn't going to be perfect. So in the bill, the Agency of Natural Resources has um, the obligation to review the definition with consultation from the EJ Advisory Council at least every five years. But to give you a rough sense of which parts of the population of Vermont highlight, if you will, as an environmental justice population, this is a spatial analysis map showing which census block groups hi highlight, and it, it's about 52% of Vermont's population. This is a map that's really just for demonstration purposes. This is different than the environmental justice mapping tool that I'll talk about in a moment. So then you get to the environmental justice state policy, which is really the meat of this bill, and it does four things. First, it sets a policy that no segment of the population of the state should, because of its race, cultural, or economic makeup, bear a disproportionate share of environmental burdens. So have more har environmental harms or be denied an equitable share of environmental benefits, like energy benefits that Dr. Panikar was talking about. It also ensures that there will be meaningful participation in decision-making, and this gets to the community engagement plans that I was talking about in terms of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. It sets a date certain for all agencies to issue these. Then you get down to C here, which is that certain specified state agencies and departments and state bodies have to start considering cumulative environmental burdens and assessing whether the decisions that they're making around environment, energy, climate, public health, they need to think about how that is having an impact on environmental justice populations. I wanna point out here that these first two are really applying statewide, whereas C is applying to the little asterisks of this list of specific agencies and departments and bodies that um, on the Senate side, when we were all talking about this, these were the bodies that came out 
as those who are making the most um, frequent decisions in the state around environment, energy, climate, public health, infrastructure, and funding. Lastly, the, the environmental justice state policy sets a targeted spending amount in environmental justice populations. Essentially, this is saying, it's acknowledging that here in Vermont, we have unfortunately an inequitable system of distributing environmental benefits or climate energy related benefits. So as, as Dr. Panikar found in her research, you know, low income or people of color are so much less likely to be enjoying the benefits of certain investments in renewable energy projects, for example. And this tracks uh, a federal initiative called the Justice 40 Initiative, which is an initiative at the, at the yeah, federal executive level to make sure that when, when the um, government is investing in climate and energy benefits, that 40% of those investments go to disadvantaged communities. Here in Vermont, we've set the goal um, in this bill of 55% of the overall benefits because thinking back to where we saw that map of the state and 52% of Vermont falls under the environmental justice population definition, that's where we landed on the 55% goal. So it's about thinking through where those benefits from energy and climate related investments really are flowing. And there's a very thoughtful uh, long runway for us to start working towards that goal that I included briefly the timeline here, which was hammered out in coordination with the Agency of Natural Resources. And it involves that, that, that agency setting guidance to help agencies figure out how exactly they're going to be assessing where their spending is going it, it establishes a timeline for those agencies to develop what are called baseline spending reports to analyze where their money has been flowing for the last three years to get a sense of our baseline. And then it sets a time frame for them to start striving towards that goal of 55%. The next section is a rulemaking section where the Agency of Natural Resources is adopting uh, really one primary rule to define the term cumulative environmental burdens uh, and also help other agencies implement this requirement and, and help us uh, help guide us for how, how we would be using the environmental justice mapping tool in those decisions. The bill also authorizes other agencies to adopt rules as needed to implement the policy. And uh, key to the bill as well is that there is an Environmental Justice Advisory Council, which I'll get to, and there's language in the bill that ensures that that council has a role in reviewing these rules. Number five, the bill sets up two uh, different councils. One is a council, one is a committee. Essentially, the way to look at this is that the EJ Advisory Council is mostly made up of community representatives. Um, it's staffed and supported by ANR, but it really has an advisory role. Whereas the Interagency Environmental Justice Committee is made up of state government representatives and it has a coordination role. So when, when agencies are required to adopt community engagement plans, for example, this committee will make sure that, that not every agency is just doing that in their own in an echo chamber, but that it is coordinated, that they're learning from each other and that they're um, they're able to take advantage of every agency working together towards that goal. Then there's the environmental justice mapping tool, which is uh, something that, as I noted, already uh, many states have these as decision makers making tools that helps depict not only where there are, um, you know, the demographic information, but also where there are overlying social and environmental uh, and other health risks layered on top so that we can get a sense of um, particularly overburdened uh, and or underserved communities in Vermont. This is just an example of what that map looks like uh, in the state of West Virginia. This map would be created and maintained by ANR. And lastly, there's a section for appropriations. Um, and we think it's really important that in year one, funding is appropriated to stand up to operationalize and to support the advisory council. And also in year one, ANR is really the only agency that has um, specific obligations. So there should be appropriations to help support ANR staff to, to 
do that early implementation of the rule. In outward years, other agencies have obligations, but in the inner first year, it's really about standing up the advisory council and supporting ANR as it, it does early stage implementation. So to conclude, there is widespread demonstrated support for the passage of S-148. Uh, I stand on the shoulders of many who have worked um, for years to get this bill, um, including Senator Rom Hinsdale, the members of Rejoice, and many others to the place that it is today. Um, it is a strong bill, but I want to emphasize that it is modest in terms of what environmental justice bills across the country are doing. Just briefly, for example, in New Jersey, their environmental justice law not only requires a cumulative environmental impact assessment for when a permit is being decided upon, but if it's found that there will be a, a cumulative environmental impact on an environmental justice population, they have to deny that permit. Vermont doesn't go that far. Also in New Jersey, it puts the onus on the permit applicant to put together all of those environmental impact review assessments. Here in Vermont, we're really setting up an initial framework and just to give us that scaffolding to begin asking those questions and to be considering things like certain populations are, are getting disproportionately impacted, but we have not gone as far as to actually control how that would impact a permit decision. So this is a critical first step for Vermont to take this year. It is modest, it is well supported, and I am happy to entertain any uh, questions today or, or happy to come back to this committee in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mahali, for your testimony. Do members have questions? Representative McCullough. I do, uh, and recognizing we are on a tight rope here, um, your answer could just be, well, I'll come back later, um, and that works. What about Act 250 as a, as a uh, permitting agency um, being responsible for reviewing appropriate projects in the light of that of, of environmental justice was that just was that discussed in the senate have has clf considered pushing for that or, and yes and yes and we'll talk about it later works if you like yes no that's a great question representative uh the natural resources board is a listed body um, when I had that slide up that had the asterisks with all of the listed entities that are subject to that cumulative environmental burden analysis, NRB is listed. Um, so they will be required to um, do that kind of assessment and to meet the, the very goals of the environmental justice policy that are in this bill. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean we gave discretion to agencies and bodies to um, change their rules and uh, guidance policies as they see fit to implement this rule. So this law isn't setting up a mandatory change to Act 250. Um, that's up to the NRB's discretion for how they're going to actually implement the cumulative impact review. Thank you. I'll just opine that it could be up to the legislator, legislatures to, to require that. But thank you very much. You're welcome. <clears throat> All right, thank you so much for your testimony. You're welcome. Um, and with that, we have um, Senator Rom Hinsdale joining us, uh, the lead sponsor of, of the bill. Welcome, Senator. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to the committee for the record. Senator Keisha Rom Hinsdale, Chittenden County, lead sponsor of S-148. Um, always great to follow Elena because she can handle a lot of the technical elements of the bill. Um, and of course, uh, I believe that Senate Natural Resources made some clear improvements um, to the originally sponsored legislation <laughs> with the help of Conservation Law Foundation, Rejoice, VPIRG, VNRC, um, 350.org, I mean, so many others. This has really been um, a clear grassroots effort with the support of a lot of environmental organizations who are recognizing more and more how to live into their commitment to environmental equity and justice. Um, so just really grateful for everyone's leadership and that you're taking 
considerable time on this as the bill crosses over. Um, I do have a presentation that I'd like to share more about the why and what does this look like around Vermont. And I'm sorry, Elena's presentation. So I hope this isn't um, <clears throat> this isn't duplicative um, in too many ways. But this is something that has been really helpful um, in sharing around environmental organizations. I've really been taking this on the road and um, a nod to uh, Professor Bindu Panikar um, because you know some of this was developed in concert with. Uh, rejoice when I was actually employed to help lead that project uh, through a High Meadows Fund grant. Um, so, I just need to interrupt. You weren't here for the beginning, but we, we're a little time constrained. Um, uh -oh. And so we have another block of witnesses coming up after you and also are hoping to be done around 10. So great. Just okay. to let you know. Thanks. Um, and are there, so there's more people between me and 10. Um, I, yeah, another. 10 or 15 minute block needs to be kind of reserved, yep. Okay, so I'll try to do this in 10 minutes. Okay, first mm -hmm. what I need to do is present slideshow, okay. There we go. Okay, so I will go quickly through some of this, which I think Elena touched on as well. Yeah, she um, did. Great, so um, what you know, I hope she had mentioned is that uh, we're now one of the last states that doesn't have an environmental justice policy on the boat. Um, this has been in the making of <laughs> time. Maine is on a parallel track. We're the last two states in New England not to have an environmental justice bill. So, you know, all of New England, I think, will be speaking the same language soon if we pass this legislation. Um, it sounds like you talked about substantive, procedural, and distributive justice, which all um, can make up a lot of public policy and meaningful participation in public policy. But much of this language was developed around what it looks like to have meaningful environmental justice policy on the books. Um, <clears throat> These are just some of the things I think surprise people, um, but hopefully help tell the story of why environmental justice uh, is such an important policy to get uh, as a framework and a lens in Vermont. Um, and as you may know, around the turn of the millennia, so around 1999-2000, our mobile home communities were some of the first to receive environmental justice grants from the EPA. Um, as, as you may know, during Tropical Storm Irene, though mobile home park residents made up 8% of the population, they were 40% of who is affected by Irene. So environmental justice has a lot to do with habitability, where folks live, whether or not they're vulnerable to flooding or heat, um, <clears throat> you know, but also how they experience recovery and how equitable resiliency and recovery is in the aftermath of a disaster. Um, as you also may know, you know, migrant farm workers, this has been another huge area of looking at what environmental injustice looks like from a the lens of a workplace environment, not just a geographic location um, or a neighborhood that's blighted and being able to have access to um, a washing machine, you know, every day to wash your work clothes and have a safe and clean and healthy place to do your work and to sleep, um, to be able to get out and experience resources in your own languages and access medical care, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> you may have also seen this because this comes straight mm -hmm from Rejoice uh, and the work with, with uh, Professor Panikar. Um, but you know, we, we know from traveling around and canvassing neighborhoods um, that BIPOC individuals were seven times more likely to have gone without heat and seven times less likely to own a solar panel. So we've talked a lot with renewable energy folks about that. And um, you know, some of our land access and home ownership disparities are the worst, some of the worst in the country. 76% um, of Vermonters Oh, I thought someone might be saying we've seen this before. Um, but 76% uh, of Vermonters of color identify as living in nature deprived areas. 72% um, of white Vermonters own homes compared to 24% of black Vermonters. And that shows up a lot in you know, <clears throat> renewable energy and how our policies work around accessing um, benefits related to energy and just you know, home improvement. Um, but in Chittenden County, as well, you see this stark disparity and it's just represented in a different way so that it's really clear. 83% of black households rent in Chittenden County. As you may have heard recently of the thousands of homeowners in Burlington, 18 are black. Um, so, you know, the disparity around who has access to land, land stewardship and housing um, and housing that they control is really vast. So you heard about the bill. I won't go back into it. Um, I think you know what I will add is that there is uh, 
there, there was a lot of work that came from frontline and grassroots communities, um, BIPOC affinity spaces, traveling to talk to most impacted individuals and compensate them for their time. So there's no pride of authorship, but there's pride of process and making sure that as changes are made, we, we have a system and a way to go back to those most impacted and make sure that those changes work to meet their needs as well and are things they can understand. That's a really big part of meaningful public process and meaningful participation. Um, you heard about the uh, resources and governance. I think what I would add um, that Elena may not have said is this tracks really well to start thinking about where benefits and investments should go with efforts underway in Washington. Um, there's an initiative called Justice 40. When we look at infrastructure dollars and other investments in uh, state government and local communities where the, that the White House is leading, that would start to look at ensuring 40% of the benefit of climate and energy proposals goes to historically disadvantaged communities. So us being able to map this out and start to find pathways for distributing those resources um, in that way is aligned with federal initiatives that are underway um, by, you know, that are supported and, and uh, advanced by this White House as well. You saw a little, you know, one example of the mapping tool um, on the left is Los Angeles, but it's a lead paint um, use of the EJ screen tool, which we have lead paint issues here in Vermont as well. So just helping to show that, illustrate that you can track, you know, where lead paint is, is predominantly still in housing with where are renters, where are people of color, um, you know, those kinds of ways of mapping. Um, I just want to, you know, sort of end with a story I told in Senate Natural Resources, because I think it's a really, it's a really nice story just to sort of illustrate the larger construct. Um, this is Bree Newsom Bass. Um, Bree Newsom Bass is famous for taking down the Confederate flag in South Carolina. Um, and people thought, yep, the, she just got fed up and climbed up there and brought that flag down. Well, if you look really closely at this picture, she has really good climbing gear on. She has really good, she has a great helmet. She has this, you know, this gear to scale a flagpole. Um, a lot of, you know, Black folks and Black women particularly don't have great access to climbing gear and, you know, the, the ability to access recreation and the outdoors. Um, when she went to go get that flagpole, I mean, go up that flagpole and get that flag, she had worked with a group of white outdoor recreation folks, white climbers, for, you know, um, the better part of a month to learn how to scale a flagpole, um, to have the right gear on and to bring that flag down. And one of the people who taught her how to climb and scale that flagpole, um, a, a white gentleman um, stood at the bottom of the flagpole and spotted her to go up. And when the police came um, and they were going to tase the pole to get her down, maybe injure her or cause her serious harm, he just held onto the flagpole so that if they tased the flagpole while she was at the top of it, they would also be tasing him. And I just tell this story because we're not just talking about, you know, dollars and cents or a mapping tool. We're talking about a different way of thinking about how people of color have been able to interact with the environment and access to outdoor recreation um, and, you know, how we work together to change our shared relationship um, with being in the outdoors and accessing things like climbing. Um, so, you know, I just tell that story because this is, a principle, this is a lens, this is a framework to really think about who's been left behind um, efforts to be in outdoor spaces and to uh, access the environment. And so with that, I just wanna thank you all for taking up the bill. I'm happy to answer any questions. Before. All right, thank you for your testimony. Um, not seeing any questions, I think um, we need to move on to our next and final witnesses. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, I'd like to welcome the Agency of Natural Resources, uh, Deputy Secretary Maggie Gendron. Thanks. Um, this is my first time, so there's go. Please join us. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm not gonna take up too much time because you've heard a lot today. And I would, and for the record, my name is Maggie Gendron. I'm the Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, I'd like to commit most of the time to Commissioner Walk to talk about what the agency's commitment is to the Environmental Protection Agency around environmental justice. And I just would like to say happy to come in here and have further conversations with you as you dive into policy. I think um, just to begin with, I, I am not going to go through the presentation I offered today. 
but it is, I did give it to Lizzie, so it should be posted online. And the reason why I put this together was um, the Agency of Natural Resources works off of the EPA's definition of environmental justice. And the, there are some core components here. You're gonna hear a lot of definitions and a lot of phrases. And so I really think that this work is complex. It takes time. And I really appreciate that this committee is willing to dive into it and talk about definitions and talk about um, anything that you might not understand and hoping that we can all bring in the right witnesses for you all to get a, a sense of what this bill does, what do the definitions mean and how does it apply to the work of, of uh, state agencies doing better in this space. Um, can I just ask you, actually, you sure. said ANR uses the EPA definition or you, what was the word that you used? I think that that sure. might be something. So we follow the definition of the EPA for environmental justice and how it applies to our work at, in natural resources. And does follow mean you use it? And That's so, um, so the definition of environmental justice, according to the EPA, is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations and policies to ensure that each person enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards, equal access to environmental benefits and equal access to the decision making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn and work. And so that that particular definition is, is important and Peter, uh, Commissioner Walk can get into it in terms of our commitment to the EPA in terms of how we move this work forward. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to highlight another piece that are that is important to the conversation. There's often reference to Title VI, which Title VI is under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that is a federal requirement for any state agency that touches federal funding has to comply with Title VI. And Title VI is the requirement of recipients of federal funding to ensure that their programs do not discriminate on the basis of race, color, or national origin. And why Title VI, the, the, the Non-Discrimination Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the non-discrimination policies embedded in that federal requirement are very much a cornerstone of environmental justice work. And two pieces that are really important that have been talked about here today is the concept of limited English proficiency and providing language access to all Vermonters in terms of how they're able to engage with decision-making. Decision-making is the second really huge core component of environmental justice. And that goes back to that intentional community engagement and making sure that not only do people have access but you're being intentional and you're not rushing through the process of inviting Vermonters to the table to be able to participate in how policies are drafted, how regulations serve Vermonters and the kinds of permitting that you might move forward with. So environmental justice is both reactive and proactive in the same regards. And I've, you've heard some of that today in terms of just institutional racism, et cetera. And um, again, I feel like you're gonna hear a lot of terms of around environmental populations, burdens, benefits, Title VI, non-discrimination. So um, I'm rushing through this, but completely happy to come back and have more conversations as you dive into this. Um, so I would like to, before I turn over to Commissioner Walk, there are two things that I'd just like to highlight. One is um, 10 states around the country have passed environmental justice legislation. It looks a little different in every state, and a lot of states have chosen a focus, whether it be air quality, water quality, high hazard um, chemical sites, and it depends on if you're in a really urban area like New Jersey, or maybe a place that has more wildfires like Washington State, and they're really concerned about air quality. So. Um, they do have focus, 30, 13 states in the country right now do have pending legislation, Vermont being one of them, um, where states are considering what do the definitions look like and what kind of tools do you need in order to do better in environmental justice. Um, and so um, one of the commitments that we made with the EPA was to work towards a goal of um, putting an environmental justice policy in place for the agency. And so part of that is we needed to um, create phases 
in order to see success because it is an incredibly overwhelming body of work that can apply to everything you work on if you let it. And so we had to really focus on where did the Agency of Natural Resources want to apply our environmental justice work in our regulatory practices and our permitting practices. And so, um, so without further ado, we have worked um, uh, we have worked with CLF in the first um, round of conversations in the Senate. I do believe there's still more work to be had on the legislation that will come before your committee. And we do appreciate these conversations because they're really, really important. But I would like to turn over to Commissioner Walk to just share what we've committed to the EPA over the next two to three years. Thank you. Welcome, Commissioner Walk. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Peter Walk, Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation. This will be the first of many conversations, I'm sure. So I just want to talk a little bit about where we are as a state, where we are as an organization, and what we're trying to accomplish over the next few years. We share the goals of the sponsor and of, of others involved in terms of better incorporating environmental justice into our decision making, into the way we do our work, and to ensure out the and the for the tenants definition that are met because we know that while Vermont may not seem like it has the same environmental issues as a place like New Jersey, we've got our own set of unique circumstances and we need to work to address those across our communities um, in the same way. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of need. That that means there's also a lot of work to do. We in, in our 2021 performance partnership agreement, which is our biannual process with the EPA, where we sit down and we talk about uh, what, are we, what are we as a state agreeing to do in the next uh, two years to, to get to, um, uh, to, to, to accomplish. We, we recognized a shared priority in environmental justice. We have committed to by uh, September of 2023, we'll sort of operate on their uh, federal fiscal year cycle there. Um, we have agreed to ad adopt a draft environmental justice policy uh, at, at the ANR. We're going to do that at the agency level with uh, draft um, pr uh, with procedural guidance for each of the departments. Um, we are looking at how to do better mapping. Um, and an overall better at, at data analysis of communities impacted. And then really looking at then how do we do our you know better training for both our staff and for for those we interact with to be able to better do this work. And one of the key features of our environmental justice policies it, that you heard today is engaging communities. Um, I know we we probably all had many conversations about uh, the challenging environmental decision making that we do as a state. And the fact that it's hard for Vermonters to engage in that in the way that they might like to. And we're plan we are working through thinking about how do we engage all, all Vermonters in that conversation, particularly environmental justice communities who may have been sort of left out of conversations for lots of reasons, whether that be the time of day of public meetings, the access to childcare and other things that make it possible to show up for those things. We all, we all have heard these uh, these challenges in the past and want to address them. Um, one of the things that we've learned through this process, and it's been a growth process for us because we're essentially starting from, from, from square one, is that we need to go slow to be able to do this well. We need to engage communities in a meaningful conversation in a way that we, uh, that, that doesn't align with sort of traditional policy development at the state level. We want to we we could have uh, several years ago written a written an environmental justice policy that we thought met the needs, but that's not the right approach. We heard from Rejoice and other partners that we needed to slow down and and ask communities uh, what their perspective are, how they need to be communicated with in order to to hear and participate in. Uh, hear and be heard in those discussions. And so we have slowed that down and are, have a process underway now where we've engaged the Center for Whole Communities uh, to, to do um, 
a pilot community engagement project to in order to understand how we can build that community engagement plan and how we can build the better practices into our the way in which we engage the public. Um, so it's it's a it's a really interesting and meaningful process. I think the mapping piece that Dr. Panikar, uh, Professor Panikar talked about is really important. Um, the tools that have traditionally existed at the federal level and in other places have really focused on 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 urban areas where it's in some ways easier. And we talked about talked about census tracts. Um, the the difference between a census tract in Vermont and a census tract in a, another part of the country can be pretty large in terms of the size of that and the fidelity of the data so that we can make sure that we have as much information as possible and make better decisions. Um, and so a mapping tool and, and understanding the data and what data is useful and where the both the gaps in that data and the sort of the area where, where it's coarser than we'd like it to be um, is really important. And we're really looking forward to digging into that work. So we're gonna, this timeline gives you a sense of what we're working on. I'll let you read it at your leisure. I'm happy to answer questions you have going forward, but I just wanted to say, this is, this is what I see as the baseline of action, setting S-148 for, aside for a moment. This is what we are doing as an agency now and what we're committed to doing. Um, and so it, you know, S-148 builds in many ways from this work and we can have discussions on what that looks like, but it's, it's a challenging body of work. It's a different way of approaching topics that we have not historically done and has created environmental injustices around the state and around our globe for this. So um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I know we have limited time, but I just wanted to give you sort of a brief overview of where we stand. Thank you. I appreciate that overview is what we were looking for just to get our heads warmed up for the conversation. Do members have questions for either the Deputy Secretary or the Commissioner? Representative McCullough. Commissioner, so you just mentioned the timeline. I just went and, and, and picked it up. Um, just but quickly, um, Deputy Commissioner used the the verb follows. You 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 follow. That means you've been doing stuff. This the timeline. Uh, I see the timeline starts in 22. What what happened in 21, 2019? What have what does follows mean? And we may not have time to go into that now, but we'll we will have a need to know. Yep, I, I, I follows follows to me as mean that's been the sort of guiding principle as we work to develop out a state specific program. Um, we're gonna so that's that's a sort of north star, if you will, towards being able to to work through those challenges um, and to build that work. We've, we've not been sitting, sitting idly by, we've been engaging with partners in this space, um, rejoice specifically on, on ways to, to move the, the conversation forward and to understand and learn from Vermont communities specifically um, so that it can inform uh, this discussion so that we're not uh, doing frankly what we've, what we've done in the past that has been part of the challenge, which is developing top-down policy that we think meets people's needs, but may not actually. So having those conversations and understanding what those needs are that are out there has been the sort of baseline uh, framework work that we've been doing. So I do understand the North Star comp concept, but I, I, I'm i just wondering if there are some concrete things you can, can send to us. Yeah, absolutely. For example, like removal of lead paint and homes. That's an example of, put it, of applying an environmental justice lens. So we can provide you some concrete examples of the kind of work that we do in water, air, um, hazardous materials that you should be applying always an environmental justice lens to when you're addressing the regulatory environment. Excellent. Of course, lead paint, um, retardation. Do we need to actually on hold the books on more people? Time. Thank you very much. We just we're about to take a break. We don't actually we can't have any more people right this second. And we're wrapping up our first agenda. Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> just one second. Um, first time we've had a room capacity <laughs> moment. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us yes, this morning right. and for the overview. And I'm yes, I'm sure we will see you again. All right. Um, please do look at the PowerPoint too. There's a lot more information in there, and I'm happy to go through it later at another day. So right. Thank you. Thank you.